Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores the human condition through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers, authors, and other interesting people to unlock the mysteries of our behavior in order to help you find your groove. And today we're speaking with a Renaissance man. He's an author, a teacher, a TED speaker, and most importantly, a podcaster. Sounds like he's checked all the boxes. Oh, at least the boxes that really matter, like podcasting, because you know those are the coolest people in the world, right? Done. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, Matt Abrahams is a lecturer at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He teaches strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. His online talks, such as his wonderful TED Talk, have millions of views, and he is the host of award-winning and one of my favorite listens, called Think Fast, Talk Smart Podcast. We wanted to talk to Matt about his work on helping people make the most out of one of the most stressful experiences many human beings will ever have, public speaking. (laughs) So we discussed how public speaking stresses your brain in the same way as basically being chased by a bear. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. And we covered some key points in this book. The most important one is about developing and executing an anxiety management plan and how it might differ from whether you're giving a toast or making a presentation to the board of directors. We also discussed the role that mindset plays in helping you with your public speaking situations. And we also want to give a big shout out to our colleague, Dave Nussbaum. He's a terrific researcher at the University of Chicago's Booth School and a senior science advisor at Behavioral Scientist. If you're not subscribed to Behavioral Scientist, we strongly recommend that you do so. We'll have links in the show notes below. Yeah, agreed. Anyway, Dave introduced us to Matt, and we are just grateful and just want to say a big thanks to Dave for all of his support. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dave. You're wonderful. And so with that, Groovers, we hope you take this time to sit back and relax with a comfortable mug of public speaking brew and listen to the soothing tones of Matt Abraham's voice as he shares his secrets on speaking in front of others to help you find your groove. Matt Abrahams, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you. I'm really excited to speak with both of you. Thanks so much. We are excited to speak with you as well. And we have to know right up front, is it coffee or tea that dominates your life? Oh, absolutely tea. I've been a tea drinker for a long, long time. Green tea with a little mix of black tea in it is what I do every day. A little. So do you, do you brew your own? Do you like... Have- I, I, I have loose loose tea and I mix... Uh, it's two-thirds green tea, one-third black tea. Wow. Just to get the little caffeinated in there? It's is a little that extra what caffeine is? and I like the little bit of bite. Okay. I and like do, you, do you start with boiling water or does it just have to be really hot? It just has to be uh, hot water. It doesn't have to be boiling. Okay. Okay. okay we, we, we have talked with some people from England <laughs> who are very, very specific on the tea brewing methodology and the temperature, and, yes, the so. timing, the order of things. Oh, uh, I, I, I optimize for time to tea, not, not <laughs> <all of that. laughs> so a good satisficer. <laughs> all right. All right. Second speed round question. And this is, I, I realize, Tim, we've asked this a couple times now and it's very topical. And so when somebody's listening to the show in 2025 and they, they will have forgotten all about no this, idea. but all right, Matt, Barbie or Oppenheimer? Barbie. Barbie. <laughs> we Barbie. met, we yeah. met 100% I like both on of them. Barbie, you oh, know? Yeah. You, you, so is far, both? Is, are most people skewing Barbie? Yes. They are. They're skewing Barbie. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I do a lot of work with DE and I, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I think the topics it brings up and the way it brings those topics up is awesome. Yeah, excellent. Okay, third speed round question: Would you rather be a guest in a podcast or the host of a podcast? This is a no brainer for me. So I, I host and have hosted for three and a half years. Think Fast, Talk Smart, a podcast. I love hosting. I, I've been a guest a lot recently mm-hmm. and it's fun, but I love learning and I love being able to ask the questions that I want to learn rather than answering <laughs> other people's questions. Maybe I'm a control freak, but I really like hosting. It's amazing. It, it, as you both know, it gives you permission to, totally. to talk to really interesting people. So hosting, no, no doubt. 
we have talked about this. This is the most fun that we have every week is when we get to do this and to to have that. But you know what? If we're going through this and, and you just want to take over control as we're doing this and start asking, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll let you well, go. Well, I mean, truth be told, before we started, you know, I was interviewing both of you. you yes, you were. did. You uh, did. Yeah. You asked. Uh, I, and I love that that question. That was being an outtake at some point, we'll get Captain Tim Curiosity. talking about his music. So, all right. Final speed round question as we go here. So we've heard that speaking in public and being chased by a bear result in basically the same feelings of fear in our brains. Do you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I absolutely agree. And I will add to that, that winning the lottery or getting a promotion at work invoke exactly the same reaction as well. Physiologically, we have one arousal response. It's how we label it and what we experience in the context to change the way we feel about it. Uh, so, all right, that's fantastic because we actually, we, we talked with uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan DePero, who's talking about resilience just before this. And so it's really interesting that we're tying this into this conversation about your book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, similar to your podcast, but a little different. You know, I'm there. not very creative. So, <laughs> so we, we, you know, if you got a name that works, go with it. So tell us about you. writing of this book and what was the the rationale for writing this book and what was the route that you took to get here at this point? So the very specific origin of this book took place almost 10 years ago when the deans of the Stanford Graduate School of Business where I teach came to me and said, we have a problem. The problem is our very bright, sharp students are struggling during cold calls. And, and you both remember what cold calls are. That's what the professor says, <laughs> what are you thinking? And our students who knew the answer, who were prepared, could not respond in a confident, competent way. And they said, hey, Matt, as the communication guy, I teach strategic communication, can you help? And that was the beginning of my deep dive into spontaneous communication. I, for a long time, have taught, as most people do when they teach communication skills, planned presenting. You think about it, you generate content, you practice it, it's, a, it's pitches, presentations, meetings. But if you really think about it, most of our life is spent speaking in the moment. Somebody asks a question, you have to give feedback, you're asked to give an introduction or a toast, you make small talk. So I really got fascinated by this topic and I explored it through the work in psychology, anthropology, sociology, improvisation, and pulled together a six-step methodology, which is captured in the book. But this is something I've been doing for, for almost a decade. And we, we teach our students, the people I coach. So it's really just codifying it and hopefully making it accessible to everybody else. Now, I'll tell you, in writing the book, because you asked about the process, I came to learn a lot about myself. I had not really realized that with the last name Abrahams, I have been spontaneous speaking my entire educational life. I always went first, right? I always knew where I sat in class and the teacher oh. always called on me first. And I just thought that was the way life went. And then I realized that's not everybody's experience. You know, the people lower in the alphabet, they got to prepare. They got to think about it. They got to hear examples. I never did. So for me, this became very personal uh, as well as I was going through this process. Dan Pink says that he thinks of a particular person who is going to be the reader of his book when he's writing. And yeah. wondering, was there was this class, were these students your target audience? Originally? Well, you know, when I when I first started creating the content and the workshop that that actually preceded this, absolutely those were the students. But then as I began to realize how valuable this methodology could be to other people, I actually had very specific coaching clients in mind as I was writing this. So I worked once with a, I think she was at the time, 72-year-old librarian. And she, she had a horrific experience when she was a young woman. She was told in a high school class by her high school teacher when she was asked to give a speech or speak up that she said the stupidest thing this teacher had ever heard. He, he verbalized that to her. And from that moment on, oh. she, she was devastated. She chose to be a librarian just to make sure she would never have to speak in front of others. And her daughter, her granddaughter, I'm sorry, was getting married and she wanted to stand up and give a toast. And I worked with her and we got her to a place, she did all the heavy lifting to, to where she could do it. It went very well. She was very pleased with it. But she, among others that I worked with, were the people I envisioned that this was for. Yeah, and it, you tell that story beautifully in the book, and uh, it's you. it's fantastic as we think about this. So let's get into 
mm-hmm. how people can improve and, and think about this, right? Because obviously, as you said, you know, spontaneity and speaking kind of off the cuff is the most, most of the speaking that we do. It's it's very rare for m- most people to be putting a presentation together and sitting up in front of a, a boardroom or whoever that would be, and you have time to prepare for that. But most of our speaking is spontaneous. It's having that conversation with a friend. It is talking to your boss. It is whoever that would be. So what are some of the things that you found that impede? Because I think that's a big part of what you're talking about in the book is, hey, there's there's some anxiety or fears that come along with this. You actually talk about AMP. Do you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Yeah. Sure. So there are many things that get in our way. The first of which is the belief that we can't get good at this. Many of us feel like I just don't have the gift of gab. I was not born to speak in the moment. And I am here to say that is absolutely not true. With persistence, with practice, everybody can get better at this. I have seen it in my own life. I have seen it in the life of my students and the people I coach. So that's the biggest barriers. People just think I can't do it. So they don't even try. So we got to get over that. You are right. Anxiety looms large in all communication, planned or spontaneous. And we have to really manage that first. And then there's some other mindset shifts that, that can help us. But when it comes to anxiety, most people feel nervous in high stakes situations. It's the rare person who doesn't. And typically, those are people who've actually worked really hard to manage their anxiety. And I use that term manage very carefully. I don't think we can ever truly overcome our anxiety around Mm. speaking. I think it's innate to being human, but we can learn to manage it. And when it comes to managing it, you have to focus both on symptoms and sources. Symptoms are the things that we physiologically experience. And there's some things we can do to mitigate those like deep breathing, like becoming present oriented, things of that nature. And then there's sources of anxiety, which are the things that initiate and exacerbate our anxiety, like the need to do it right, for example. So we can manage both. And in all of my teaching, the teaching I've been doing for over two decades now, I ask all of my students to create what you referred to, which is an anxiety management plan. I call it an AMP. Everybody finds different routes to managing their anxiety. The very first book I wrote was called Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. And it's all about anxiety management, lists 50 techniques you can use. I don't expect all 50 techniques to apply to any one person. So most people's anxiety management plan is like three to five. I'll tell you mine if you're interested. So my my anxiety yeah. management plan is yeah. three things. Before I speak, before I got on this, this uh, podcast, I did these things. First thing I do is I take some deep belly breaths. It slows down my heart rate. It makes sure that uh, my voice is resonant because when we breathe shallow, our voices change. So I took some deep belly breaths. I remind myself that I have some value to bring. Many of us get inside our heads and say, no, nobody's going to care what I say. I should have prepared more. We say all this negative stuff. So I like to say a positive affirmation. I have value to bring. And then the third thing I do to get present oriented is I say tongue twisters. (laughs) You can't say a tongue twister right and not be in the present moment. And it warms (laughs) up your voice. Most people, when they speak, don't warm up their voice. But we know when we exercise or play a sport, you should warm up. We should warm up our voice. So I did those three things right before we connected and it's put me in a much better place. You can tell me if I sound nervous or not, but I certainly feel better. You don't sound nervous at all, but I have to ask, what is the tongue twister that you Ah, brought? I'm happy to share, but but I will share it on the condition that you both repeat it after me. It's three phrases. I will try. I will try. All right. And here's why I like this one so much, Kurt, is if you say it wrong, you say a naughty word. Now, I know you have a (laughs) G-rated podcast, so I'm putting a little pressure on all of us. Whatever, whatever. We can can go off the range. Okay, here, well, you'll find it. You'll figure out what it is very quickly. So I, I say this to myself. I say it three times out loud fast. We'll only do it once. I slit a sheet. I slit a sheet. I slit a sheet. A sheet. I slit. A slit. I shit. <laughs> there it is. There it is. I there it is. takes people to the third phrase, not the second one. So yeah. the whole thing goes, I'll just say it quickly. I slit a sheet, a sheet I slit, and on that slitted sheet, I sit. Oh. Woo. And usually I where I catch I people, Tim, is on that last phrase, not the not the middle <laughs> one. You're, you're, you're good. Oh, no. Yeah, right. Well, I have not tamed my anxiety beast. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But, you know, we have this notion that we can go from silence to brilliance. 
and and for me personally, that's not easy. So I have to warm up my voice before I, I start. Yeah. And, and so yeah. that helps me. Uh, tell us about mediocrity. Why <laughs> is mediocrity... Uh, first of all, I love the idea that you celebrate it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but first, uh, tell us what, what you mean by mediocrity. Right. So this all boils down to most of us, when we communicate, especially spontaneously, we want to do it right. We want to come off as the best self that we possibly can. We have this goal to be perfect in our speaking. And the reality is there is no right way to communicate. There is no perfect response or reaction in these spontaneous situations. There are certainly better and worse, yet we carry this burden of wanting to do it right, so much so that we are constantly judging and evaluating to a very deep level everything we're saying as we're saying it or before we're about to say it. And what that does is it literally reduces our cognitive bandwidth that we have to focus on what we're saying. So I have the audacity in the very first class that I hold of my strategic communication class at, at Stanford is I start by saying, maximize mediocrity. And these <laughs> MBA students who are type A and have yeah. always succeeded, their jaws drop. They're like, what do you mean? But when we do some activities and I explain this notion of cognitive load, they get that if they reduce the pressure, if they dial down that desire to be right and perfect just a bit, it actually frees them up to be more present and to respond well. Nice. So by the end of that first class period, I say to my students, maximize mediocrity so you can achieve greatness. Mm -hmm. Because in turning that volume down, you deliver better. Now, I am certainly not saying we shouldn't judge and evaluate what we say. We absolutely should. But some of us, and I know you guys that will get this reference, dial it up to 11, when in <laughs> fact, if we kept it you know, at a two or a three, we would be much more effective in our communication. So that's what I mean by mediocrity and striving to get that done. Well, maximizing mediocrity is like the story of my life. So I'm, <laughs> I'm probably pretty good at that. I don't know if I've gotten to that excelling at greatness part on the back end, but there, it, it reminded me actually in reading that, you named a chapter that, which I loved, yes. by the way. But it reminded me of Herbert Simon and Satisficing versus Maximizing and this idea of, hey, it, it's okay sometimes to just have a level of proficiency, a right. level of satisficing that, yeah. you know, if you met, meet that, don't worry about trying to get that extra 5%, 10% because you're, it's only going to add to the anxiety that you have in, in this situation or the, the, the return that you get from that is not going to be worth all the effort that goes into it. Is that similar to what you're saying absolutely. here? No, yeah. Absolutely. That, you know, the, the idea that I use can, can, comes from improvisation. And there's the, there are a lot of amazing rules in improv. You know, they say dare to be dull, which is essentially the same thing. But also do what needs to be done. And sometimes what needs to be done is just enough. And that's it. You know, to, to constantly judge and evaluate and ruminate gets us in trouble. Yeah, it's, it's hard, I think, in real time for a lot of us to make those calls. I won't editorialize on that anymore. I want to talk about the fact that you identify specific types of communication in the book to, to yeah. deal with. That can all be stressful. Small talk, toasts, uh, providing feedback, all this kind of saying that we're sorry. Um, yeah. I was particularly fascinated by the toast for some reason, this whole idea that it confounds us. Yeah. What makes what are we doing wrong basically when we when we give toast? What what can make us better at well if it's at a celebratory event, we're drinking and we should not do that. Uh, that's that's, that's, <laughs> that's what the we, number one problem. We should right? we shouldn't drink. <laughs> you, you, you should not have alcohol before it's your turn to speak, right? Uh, that is that's not likely not gonna help. So again, in toasts and tributes, we are trying to to do it really well. And in so doing, we get caught up in a few traps. One we make it more about ourselves than the other. I, I, I like people to envision a toast or a tribute as a gift. You're giving a gift. And when you give a gift, you typically think about the person or the people involved. You think about what they would like. You think about what would be appropriate for them. And the same is true when we give a toast. Most of us don't think that. Most of us think about, oh, I've got this really funny story and it ends up being about you, the toaster, not the people you're giving the toast or tribute to. It ends up being inside baseball where only a few people in the room understand it. It tends to be more detailed than it needs to be. 
So we need to avoid all of that. We need to remind ourselves that a toast is an opportunity to demonstrate gratitude, connection, and a toast is a public event. Others are there. And so you need to include them or at least make sure they don't feel excluded. And as with everything in the book and the methodology, it boils down to having a structure or a framework. When we have to communicate, we have two fundamental tasks, what to say and how to say it. A structure or framework, which is nothing more than a logical connection of ideas, helps us because it tells us how we're going to say it. Think of it as a recipe. You can make pretty good meals if you have a good recipe. And all you have to do is insert the different ingredients into the recipe. The same is true when giving a toast, when answering questions, when making small talk. So for giving a toast, I have a structure I like. It is the acronym WHAT, Mm -hmm. W-H-A-T. What starts with the W, why are we here? Now, if you're at a wedding, you don't have to explain why we're here, everybody gets it. But if you're at a a company meeting or a lunch and all of a sudden you're gonna give a tribute to the team, you would say, hey, we're gonna talk about this new product release that really everybody worked hard at. So that's the, why are we here? And then what you need to do next is explain how you are connected. Again, if you're at a corporate event, people know you're the vice president of product so that you don't have to say, I'm the vice president of product. But at a wedding, you might have to say, I've known the bride for 20 years because most people don't know how you're connected. So how are you connected is the second step. The A stands for anecdote. Give a short, clear, concise, applicable story or two. Run these stories by people or think through how they played in the past, <laughs> right? And then finally, the T is for thank, thanking people, giving a toast. So the WHAT gives you a way to do it. So in the moment, if I were to say, hey, Kurt, you know Tim well. This is his seventh anniversary of doing this podcast. Would you give a few words? You don't have to panic. You know I'm going to say, Why are we here? How are we connected? I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to toast. And then it makes it easier for you. In in that in in that toast situation, which I'm just trying to think now, what would I toast for Tim? Um, and I'm yeah, I'm going nothing. the antidotes. I mean, there's way too many to pick from. Um, but with that, uh, we I I feel and and correct me if I'm wrong on this is that we tend to think about those toasts, particularly and again, I'm thinking about this at mostly weddings and those types of situations, is trying to come up with something that is funny. Yeah, and. I think that is a a piece where uh, I know I, if I'm in that situation, I'm trying to to try to think of something funny and I might end up as being funny, but I'm not very good at thinking about being funny. Um, Is that something that you've seen in in the work that you've done? Is that part of this? uh, And and do we need to be funny in, in, in that kind of situation? I don't think we do need to be funny. Uh, Being humorous is is a great way to engage and connect, but it can be very scary and risky. And and trying to be funny and not being funny is worse than just not being funny at all, right? Right. Exactly. So so some people are are, are being funny is a little more comfortable for them. You know, there's a wonderful book that comes from two of my colleagues at Stanford's Business School. It's called Humor Seriously by Jennifer Ocker and Naomi Bagdonis. And it is the only business book I've ever read that made me laugh out loud. And they give (laughs) advice and guidance on how to develop your own sense of humor and how to suss out if you are actually being funny or not. And uh, it's a very helpful read. But the, to put pressure on yourself to be funny in a toast is really hard. So just start with a heartfelt gift you want to give. And if something humorous comes as a result, great. But if not, you're still giving a really nice gift. Mm. Yeah. Mindset is another thing that you bring up as being very important. What, uh, what about mindset is so important to us when it comes to this kind of speaking? Thanks for that question, Tim, because in the six-step methodology, the first four steps are all about mindset, and the last two are about messaging. Uh, I love M&Ms, and so having something that's a mindset and message just makes me feel good because it's (laughs) paying homage to my favorite candy. But uh, (laughs) mindset mindset is is really important uh, in this. Many of us, I've already talked about how we want to get it right, that perfection desire. But the other thing that comes up is when we communicate Uh, we often see these spontaneous situations as threats or challenges. Mm. So 
I have to answer your question and I better do it right. Or I have to give you the right feedback so you can do better. We, in small talk, it's like, I have to say something that's really interesting and engaging or people are going to think I'm silly. So we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. So we, we act defensively. We, we see these as challenges, as hurdles to, to overcome. If we can shift that to see these as opportunities, when somebody asks me a question, even if it's challenging, it is an opportunity to learn from them to extend and expand what I've said and perhaps even collaborate. When I am in a small talk situation, I have the opportunity to learn about myself, to learn about others, to make a connection. So if we reframe these as opportunities, it actually can help reduce the stress we feel and it has a direct impact on how we communicate. When I feel defensive, my body posture changes, my tone is more curt, my responses are, are, are definitely shorter and but when I see it as an opportunity, I literally open up and I expand and extend what I say. So mindset shifts are really important. And one other part of the mindset piece is listening, by the way. People think listening, you're talking about speaking and communicate. Listening is critical because if you miss the nuance of what's going on, you can get yourself in trouble. Yeah. I miss the nuance all the time with Tim. Or maybe it's just <laughs> because he doesn't have nuance, but I don't know. Um, but um, okay. With, with that, with the mindset, you you bring up this in the book, next play, and some yeah. some kind of little elements within there. You want to talk a little bit about how that 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 yeah. tactic works, um, and, and then you also talked about mistakes. I think, I, and forgive me if I, I got that wrong, but no, uh, you got that feel, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, is part of the chapter on making these mindset shifts to seeing things as more opportunistic. Uh, there are some tools that you can use. And I borrow these tools from lots of places, from improvisation, from Carol Dweck's work on, mm -hmm. on growth mindset, from um, the, the world of television and sports. So let me run through three that I think are really important. In, in growth, the, the approach to growth mindset, especially, I, I love Carol Dweck's work. She has this notion of not yet. And I think not yet is very powerful. So when we have something that doesn't go well for us, we can really beat ourselves up. We can feel really bad about it. But if we remind ourselves that this doesn't mean we'll never get good at it, it doesn't mean that, that we're bad people, it's part of that growth mindset. We simply say, not yet. I'm not yet good at responding to a question about the technical details of this thing. Doesn't mean I won't be, doesn't mean I'm not motivated now to get better, but I love this notion of not yet to give ourselves permission to continue to proceed learning and practicing. Similarly, when we do underperform by our own judgment, we can borrow from the world of sports. And, and the famous basketball coach, Mike Krzyzewski, is, is credited with this. Coach K is credited with this notion of next play. When an athlete makes a mistake, you immediately need to shift gears and go to the next play. Think of basketball, a very fast-moving sport. If I miss a shot or make a mistake, and I sit there ruminating and beating myself up, the other play on the other end of the court is already transpiring, and I am no longer part of that. So we need to remind ourselves of next play. And it doesn't only apply to when we don't do well. It applies when we do really well. Sometimes yeah. we want to boast and burge in that moment and say, this was great, when in fact, we're mix missing the next play. So I, I encourage people in the moment when you might not answer a question super well, just say next play and move on. Later, reflection is a good thing. Reflection is very helpful to improving communication, but not in the moment. And then the final thing you brought up, and thank you for bringing this up, a lot of us see mistakes as a bad thing. We don't want to make mistakes. Making a mistake is not good. In fact, we learn from mistakes. And so one way that's helped me in my life and my students and the people I coach is to reframe mistakes as missed takes. Many people are familiar with when you're filming a television show or a movie, they do the different takes. They have that clapboard where they go take one, take two, and you're doing uh, the same scene, but a slightly differently. So maybe the actor is standing versus sitting. Maybe you say it with one type of emotion versus another. No one take is bad or wrong. It's just do it again and look for a different opportunity. So if we approach the times where we don't do well, if we just say, okay, that one didn't well, I'm going to do it again and see if it, it comes out better. It's just take two, take three. That takes some of that pressure off and the negative emotion that comes from it. So not yet, next play and missed takes are tools to help us see our speaking as one of opportunity and connection rather than one of challenge and defensiveness. And in this world of mindsets, can we 
just do a little shout out for your colleague, Aaliyah Crum at the oh, Mind yes. and Body Lab. Yes. Aaliyah is fantastic. I interviewed her very early on uh, in my podcast. She's fantastic. And then the stuff she is doing is foundationally changing how people experience their own lives uh, yeah. and get healthy and all these other things. She, she's fantastic. Yeah. Love that. And, We're and love total that. fanboys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Let's switch gears a little bit because you talked about the podcast and you you interviewed um, there. So when you, you when you're thinking about the podcast, it, it's slightly different than than the book. It, it yes. expands beyond communication. What what do you talk about? So how do would you describe your podcast for our listeners? Because I think yeah, there's so a lot I'm, of overlap. Yeah. So think fast, talk smart. The name of the podcast. The book is Think Faster, Talk Smarter. I, I got to get more creative. But the the podcast actually goes beyond spontaneous speaking. It is all about communication. Our goal is to help people hone and develop their communication skills. So we talk about topics like negotiation, persuasion, how to be creative. Uh, spontaneous speaking is part of it. So is managing anxiety. But we have a wonderful time discussing these topics. We're very short. We're about 20 to 30 minute episodes. In fact, we I didn't even know this was an award, but we won an award for best dog walking podcast because what? most people <laughs> walk their dogs for roughly 20 minutes. Way and we to fit go. into that time frame. Uh, so it, it's been wonderful to, to chat with all these folks and to really help people around the world experience communication skills and get in interesting, useful knowledge. So much so that we just recently started providing English language learning content along with our episodes. So when somebody listens in from a country wow. where they don't speak English or they don't speak English well, we pull out certain concepts like a noun, a verb, an idiom. We had somebody on the, the podcast who said, uh, was talking about skin in the game. Mm. Well, that's you know, if you're a non-native speaker, that's a really interesting phrase. So what we're doing is we're, we're helping people. The goal is to really help people learn to hone and develop their communication. I have to say, I've listened to not all of the episodes, but a number of the episodes. Uh -huh. And you do a fantastic job of not only getting into some really interesting pieces, like you said, negotiation, some of the other types of communication you do, but providing some really good applicable insights for people that they can take and move and start practicing those pieces right away. And that, that I think is fantastic. Um, with that, Going back to the book now, sorry, yeah. or actually, it doesn't have to be from the book. It can be, yeah. it can be from anything. If if, if you were to give our listeners um, three three things that they could do uh, to improve how they communicate, whether it be spontaneous or not, if and again, you can pull from a wide variety. You've read a book that has fifty different pieces on on this, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm obviously. These are going to be varied for different people, but what would three that you can kind of recommend? Uh, great. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so first and foremost, across all the podcast episodes, and we, we just celebrate our, celebrated our 100th uh, anniversary episode. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. We, um, across all of it, the, the, the one topic that comes up more than any other is we have to be in service of our audience. People say it in different ways. It's not about you. It's about them. Know your audience. Figure out who you're speaking to. I had Julian Treasure on. He, is, uh, he, he talks a lot about listening. And I loved his way of saying that. He said, what is the listening I am speaking into? It's, I love that phrasing, but it's all, it, it, they're all saying the same thing. You have to take time, even if it's spontaneous in the moment, to think for a second, what's important and relevant to this audience? What do they know about this topic? Because we've all been in situations where people talk past us or above us or below us. So we need to target. That is number one by far. Number two, I, I hinted at earlier, structure. If you have a structure, you have a roadmap and that roadmap can help you navigate lots of different types of challenging situations. And the third one might surprise you. I think the ability to paraphrase is critical. Paraphrasing implies in, in it that you are a good listener. So, so I'm getting two for one here. You have to listen well to be able to paraphrase. It isn't just parroting back. Paraphrasing is finding the crux, the bottom line of what somebody is saying, and then doing something with it. It demonstrates that you've listened, 
It allows you to connect different content together. It allows you to shut down people who are speaking too much. It allows you to insert your voice in a conversation that's already going on. So paraphrasing to me is like a Swiss army knife for a really tricky communication skill. So know your audience, understand and appreciate and be able to use structure and be able to paraphrase by listening well. Those three can help everybody get better at communication. Matt, on that, can we dig a little deeper on the paraphrasing piece? Because I, yeah. I agree and I've, I've done some corporate work with people on communication and it's one of those pieces we bring in. And sometimes I get feedback that it feels like that's a, that's a trick. And, and I, if I do it, it, people will feel like it, I'm just using a method on them. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about paraphrasing, can you give an example of, of how does a paraphrase work and, and how do you do it such that it feels, it comes across as natural, maybe, maybe I'm overthinking that, but that's where I, I was going. Paraphrasing is a very useful tool that if deployed pro- appropriately, isn't seen as a trick. It isn't seen as a gimmick. So I'm going to take a timeout. I do this in my classes all the time. I just did what I think is a fairly good paraphrase of what you said, (laughs) right? And so I don't know if it felt like, oh, Matt's saying, oh, Kurt, what I hear you saying is, no. What I try to do when I paraphrase and what I coach and teach people to do is the core essence of your question to my mind was, how do you do paraphrasing so it doesn't feel like some kind of trick or gimmick? That's yeah. what I heard you asking. So what I did in my immediate response to you was I highlighted that, but I also gave my position. So you have some direction out. You know where I'm going to take my, my response. That to me is an effective paraphrase. It's not the, so what I hear you saying is, that, that seems and feels overly scripted and does feel like a trick. So if you can extract some key value, mm-hmm. comment on it, that's how effective paraphrasing works. Imagine this. We three are in a, a hot and heavy conversation where we're like we were before we said, and, and now even we're, we're talking a lot. We're over talking each other and somebody else wants to get insert their point of view into our conversation. It would be very hard. What I recommend they do is paraphrase. So they could jump in and say, folk music from the early 70s is amazing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they're joining our conversation. Now, that's an inside joke for those of you who are just joining us. Before we started, we were talking about types of music we enjoyed. But by, by paraphrasing something they heard and asserting it, it gives them a wedge to participate. So you can use paraphrasing not just as a tool to demonstrate receptivity, like I heard what you said, you can use paraphrasing as a, as a proactive tool to insert yourself in conversation. But again, it's not what I hear you saying is. Those are great. Those are great tips. And thank you for the specificity around that too. I really appreciate that, Matt. You wrote, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read from the text here because I love this particular part. What? Perfectly. A classical musician performing a Chopin etude in public memorizes every last note in advance in hopes of achieving perfection. But speaking extemporaneously is more like jazz. It's about improvising, trying to get and stay in the groove with others around us. Okay, I'm just going to like have that little moment of just, (laughs) ah, just, just kind of love that. Um, Why is it, why is this metaphor of, of comparing the Chopin memorization to the jazz needing to kind of uh, flex on the fly so important to us? Well, in many ways, it gets back to what we talked about before about trying to be perfect. When when we set up a right way to do it, we associate our, our and judge our success based on that. And the reality is life is a lot more like jazz. Things change and we have to adjust. When I attach myself to a very particular way of doing it, memorizing, be it music or my script, I get tunnel vision. That's how I see things. I talk about in the book, uh, the notion of heuristics, heuristics Mm -hmm. or mental shortcuts that we use. And they're very helpful. I'm not saying there aren't times where we should memorize something, you know, we should know phone numbers. That's important. Uh, (laughs) We should have, we should have heuristics that we can, we, we can use. But when you leverage a heuristic, when you memorize, you lock yourself into a way of thinking and a way of speaking that doesn't allow you to be agile and adept at something. I, I like to use jazz and I, I like to use sports as analogies because in sport, it is you have to be very agile. You can't do the same thing the same way every time. You have to adjust and adapt. And if you go in saying, I'm going to do this one thing this one way, life gets in the way 
not only do you get disappointed and frustrated, but you're not likely to going to perform up to the best level. So that piece, that, that part of the book you called out, I think is very important to help people disabuse themselves of trying to be perfect, trying to memorize and attaching themselves to one way of doing something. Yeah, let's say that the sport is a good analogy, but it's clearly inferior to the music analogy. Let's just, <laughs> let's just put that out there. <laughs> For some people, Tim, that is exactly right. Yeah, there are others who might disagree. That, and it, it, Kurt might be one of those people, actually, uh, that, so that, which is fair enough. You know, we, as a good communicator, I think we need to find the hooks that can connect our messages to the people we're speaking to. And that's why in the book, I use lots of different analogies. And you've heard me today even do that. So I've talked about structure as a recipe. I've talked about it as a roadmap. I, you, you need to come at it from different angles to connect with as many people as possible. You know, I learned this a long time ago. My, my, my MBA students, I tell them the power of analogies and analogies are great. But if you use an analogy somebody doesn't understand, it actually works against you. And we here in the US, we use a lot of sports analogies. Sorry, Tim. But it's things like <laughs> a slam dunk, hit it out of the park. You know, my students who are not from the U.S. struggle. And I had one get up once in the middle of a speech. He used an analogy to the game of cricket. Yeah. And that's what he heard in the audience. Nobody said anything because we didn't know what the hell he was talking <laughs> about. And he stopped. And I still remember this. This was like seven, eight years uh, ago. He stopped and said, that's how I feel when all of you use analogies to American uh, football. And it was so powerful. And the, wow. the method, the, the message I'm taking away from that and trying to impart we have to find ways to connect our content to our audience, and we have to be nimble and adept at doing that. We cannot go in and say, I'm going to talk about this being a slam dunk, and nobody in my audience knows how to play basketball. I have yeah. to adjust. Yeah. It's not a sticky wicket, right? As I do uh -huh. for the cricket. There you go. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> Nicely played. You... You used a word in that sentence, though, that I that I read from the book that we find particularly interesting, and that is groove, given yeah. that that's uh, the title yeah. and it's something that we pay a lot of attention to. Yeah. Why is getting in the groove so important with public speaking? I, I think it's not just public speaking. I think it's just relating to other human beings. You know, to me, groove is is synonymous with flow, the flow state that Chicksamahai and others talk about. It's about being in the moment. It's about being absorbed by what's happening so that you can be agile and you can be uh, able to adjust. I've done martial arts for, for over four decades and I've learned the hard way, literally been hit <laughs> with this uh, notion that if you're not in the moment, if you're not in the groove, then you're not able to respond as well. And that when you're in that groove, not only does it help you connect, but it feels really good. I mean, we've all had that conversation that was intense and engaging and we were just there and it was going in lots of different directions. Part of that is we were in the groove. We were in that moment connected and present. And the better able we are to get there, the better our communication will be, the better our understanding of the other will be. And that's why I like the notion of being in the groove. So if we take this music thing just a little bit farther. <laughs> sure, let's go with it, Tim. <laughs> let's imagine that you're stranded on a desert island for a year and you get to take two catalogs of music with you, uh, two artists' catalogs with you. Which two artists would you take, Matt? Oh, oh. man. All right, so these are going to be very different. So I, I have become a huge fan of Rodrigo y Gabriela. They play, um, I love guitar, and they play acoustic guitar, and they play it in a way that I have never seen others play it. I have subsequently, because I like them so much, discovered others do this same thing. They do a version of what I would call flamenco. With It's fantastic. And what I really like about it is, is when I hear it, I just get so present and so involved. I also am a child of you know the 70s, and, and so I love what I call hard rock. So I would probably bring some hard rock band. Because if I'm on an island by myself, I'm going to need to be pumped up and get excited. And, and so listening to something like ACDC, Leonard Skinner, something like that ah, okay. uh, would help me feel a little more um, connected to the world. So two very different types of music, but that's what I would take. I, I, I'm sure, Tim, you have very strong opinions on my my choices, but that, I, that would help me. I'm... I'm uh 
all good with all types of music. So I think okay. that that's fantastic. But uh, for this, for the listeners who are not familiar, use the term flamenco, uh, yeah. which uh, oh no, <laughs> well no, I mean, uh, well, uh, uh, it's a it's a Spanish form of yes. guitar based music, uh, yeah. and is often accompanied by dance. But yes. um, but what makes this Rodrigo y Gabriela so interesting is that it's not they're not Spanish they're Actually, it's a Mexican group. Is that is that correct? I believe, yeah, I believe they're from Mexico. Uh, but you know, you can play music from all different parts of the world. Yeah, but what I love right. about it is the precision, uh, because when they are finger picking, it is amazing the precision. But at the same time, there's this little element of chaos in it, uh, <laughs> and you have to listen to it. And I like that. It's 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 like controlled chaos that that just is so mesmerizing. And to see them play with what they do with the instrument and what they do with their hands. I, I love watching anybody who is a master of anything. I am, you know, it, it can be the most minute thing. I love watching mastery in motion. And, and I, I believe they are masters at what they do. And that's why I love watching communicators who are really good at what they do. Uh, it, it's just something I, I get mesmerized by. I, I have to say, Matt, that Tim is a musical whore. Um, and so, uh, well, your, your well, musical, he, he, is, he, is, now. <laughs> he, he will take any kind of music and oh. just run with it. So I think, you know, that is a perfect, uh, way of describing Tim's musical preferences on, <laughs> on some of these did. things. Wow. So Tim, do you have a retort? I mean, I don't know. None. But... I, only to accept the compliment. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Uh, Matt, we are grateful for the time and the conversation, and uh, thanks for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. I really appreciate it. This has been a lovely conversation. I've learned a lot about both of you and a little bit about myself as well, which is, which is a good conversation. So thank you for your time and, and uh, inviting me on. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Matt. Have a free-flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our publicly speaking anxiety-filled brains. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> no, all right. So I have to ask you, do you get nervous when you speak in public? Sort of. I'm kind of hedging my bet there just because I've done it a lot. And yeah. yet I still kind of have a little bit of a little bit of positive stress, like I want to make this good. Like I want yeah. to take all the experience that I've had and combine it into something that makes sense for this audience. I'm you, the same I mean, way. I'm the same way. I speak a ton, right? We yeah. we both do. We, we, we do public speaking. We present keynotes. We do other things. Leading will workshops. Workshops, you know, all sorts of things. It's, meetings, it's, presentations. It's the world that I, that I live in, it's it's my job, basically, a lot of it. But I think there's an interesting piece because I've talked about this with others. And I might have talked about it with you. So I've spoken in front of thousands of people. You know, I've done toasts. I've done, you know, workshops, all this other stuff. The most nervous I ever got was when I spoke for the first time. It was a three minute, five minute presentation uh, in front of my Rotary Club. Uh, back when I wow. first joined my Rotary Club. Wow. And I literally was like, my hands were shaking. I was, it, it's all the classic symptoms that you yeah. have. And and in retrospect- it's like 60, 70 people, so, you know. Probably about 60 people in the room. And in, in retrospect, what I realized is that much of my speaking is with audiences or groups that, I don't necessarily have to see over and over and over again. I mean, some of right. the, we've done workshops in front of, of organizations where we do series of them and various different things, but I'm not working. I'm not seeing them every week. My Rotary Club, I was going to have to, if I, if I flubbed up, I was going to be having to like go next and week. sit next to these guys the next week and the week after and the week after. Oh my God, that was nerve wracking. Yeah, that spotlight effect is like every time you walk into a rotary meeting from that day on, they're going to know that you were the guy that I was up. the guy that totally <laughs> flubbed up in his little like, five minute intro speech on who is Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and then that too, I mean, the topic was tell us about yourself. I mean, it was like mm -hmm. not a topic that was 
very hard at all, but it was very difficult and the most anxiety I've ever had in giving a speech, maybe outside of like high school or, or college when you had to give up and you know, present in front of your class, but I don't well, remember those. Well, really. why was it? Why were you anxious? Let's talk about that for just a minute, because I think that this might fit into some of the things that Matt talked about. Well, so again, I think it was because I knew that if I did mess up, that I'd be seeing these people again, okay. and that I didn't know these people all that well, I was still relatively new. Mm-hmm. I was a junior person. I was in my early 30s. Uh, and most, I was the youngest person in the club at that time. Uh, so most of these people were 40s, 50s, 60s, um, okay. and senior in their professions. So I think there was a lot that was going on in my head, yeah. more so than reality. Again, noise. Noise. It was like the the ruminating of, well, what if I, what if I say something wrong? What if I, what if I freeze up there? What if I, you know, mess up and I'm boring and I, I tell a joke and it falls flat. You know, all of those types of things that. But wouldn't you be used to that? Like telling jokes <laughs> and having them fall flat? You do that all the time. Like you're good at that. <laughs> I am. I'm now good at that. And I'm, I'm accustomed to the dead silence when I, when I give a joke, but back then I thought I might oh, be, you know, you know, oh, okay. you know, I've just gotten more, you know, <laughs> calloused and, and, and hardened in front of, of audiences. So actually it's funny because I did act. So going back just two weeks, I uh, was the MC at our rotary um, foundation dinner that happens every year. Mm-hmm. And so I was up speaking in front of everybody and I, told a joke and it fell flat. And I said, well, I was expecting a little bit more from that. And then people laughed. And so, so yeah, I was able to recover. So that, there you go. And that, some of that's just experience. Yeah. And but part of it's being in, in front of people that I now know really well, and I don't have to worry about it. And you so, don't care. I don't care. They, I, I have enough history of 20 plus years history that yeah, any single speech is not going to define who they think I am. Well, you know, I started performing when I was, I think my first public performance when I was playing guitar was like I was 13, like not, not in my living room, you know, I mean, but actually out at a bar, you know, Whoa. and um, I was pretty anxious about saying anything like I was there to, to play music. I just wanted to play. And so I felt like that was like the most calming and comfortable part was presenting the musical stuff. But what I said in between was something that was was a cause of a bit of anxiety. And so I, I started making notes like, okay, what does this audience, what might this audience want to know about this song? Or what do I feel is relevant? And so uh, again, kind of getting to Matt's stuff, like his anxiety management plan, I started naturally started thinking about, well, who is my audience? Yeah. I, I started it and Maybe we should actually just blend right into talking about Matt's stuff because I think. Well, but no, I think this is good because I think what you're talking about, this know your audience, and you were focusing your notes on how to talk, like what will they care about for this song, right? Um, What is the structure that will serve your audience best? So music, but this, they expect some talking in between, right? I mean, a, that's part a little of it. Right. Yeah, but not, not too much, right? So you know right. the structure. And, and again, for me, as I was thinking about going back to that first time speaking in Rotary, I didn't know my audience. I should have. I probably would have been better served if I would have known, but I'd been in the club maybe a month or two and you got to get up and give your little, you know, get to know you speech. And I didn't really know that many people in there. Mm. Um, I had a structure, but it was five minutes and I, I, I don't know. Anyway. Um, and then his last piece on that anxiety management is, is tame the anxiety beast by planning ahead, reframing and reminding yourself of that plan. Yeah, and I yeah. definitely didn't reframe that piece, that reframing, that mindset aspect of this, I think is so important for people when they are going through that. And I don't know about you, but now, I mean, I still get nervous before present presenting and before workshops, before getting up, particularly larger audience, audiences that I haven't done things before, but I do actively refrain. 
I think that that's a really healthy way of doing it. And anybody can do that. I don't think it takes a lot of experience to, you know, you don't have to have 30 years of experience doing something to just say, well, wait a minute, where, where am I? What am I doing? What, what are the real consequences of this? Yes. Like, okay, let's dial it down. Let's pull, let's dim the spotlight effect on me, on myself. And I'm not the, you know, I'm going to be the most important thing for the next three and a half minutes, but then people are going to forget about me. They're not going to be thinking (laughs) about me for the rest of their lives and thinking about what I said and how I said it. So dial it back a little bit. And then there's also that, that lovely reframing of, uh, because, you know, our system, our, our, the body doesn't really know the difference between being chased by a bear and speaking in front of people in public. Let's go, well, wait a minute. I'm not being chased by a bear. Right? <laughs> nobody's going to throw spears at me because <laughs> I screwed up and I'm not sitting around and having, you know, it's right. not that. It, it, most of our speaking is not life or death speaking situations, no, right? That's right. Right? We don't, or we aren't in that. It's not even big physical harm like the bear's not gonna maul us right there's not gonna be you know long-term elements so yeah calm and and you're gonna do much better with that so what else tim what else can we talk about well um how about uh active listening let's let's talk about some some of the tips that matt had i thought were, were particularly good yeah, well, one of the things that he talked about was paraphrasing, which yeah, reminded yeah. me of active listening. Yes. So paraphrase, you know, he talked about, so let, let you know, you saying, let me see if I got this right. What you're saying is, which is a, yes. a, a type yeah. of active listening. Active listening is a whole uh, element. Again, I've done workshops on communication within organizations, and we bring up active listening all the time, this idea of, when you are listening to somebody, if you can paraphrase what they said and in a manner that isn't just repeating exactly word for word, but paraphrasing, taking that active listening, it does a couple of things. Is one is you quickly understand, hey, no, I, th- I got that wrong, right? They go, no, that's not what I said at all, you right. idiot. <laughs> right, right. Well, and you get to find out right away. You get to oh. find out right away is making that assumption, but B... What's really interesting about about that is that when you do that, people uh, feel like you are listening to them. They feel that you care more. They feel that you um, are uh, you are actively concerned about their point of view. And so, if you're having a dialogue, it's really important to do that. And it's it's just great. And I always talk about it going back to our conversation with Kwame Christian, to do this with this idea of compassionate curiosity, that it, it's it's really important. We come back to Kwame, this compassionate curiosity, all the time. That was like episode 178. That was a yeah. long time ago. Yeah, and I think uh, we probably brought it up 10 to 15 times at it's least. It's invaluable. And, yeah. yeah, so. Well, and just to uh, amplify that, this idea of compassionate curiosity, of course, Kwame was uh, introduced it to us in the framing of negotiation of right. how how you find a better you find a common ground with your uh, the person that you're negotiating with. But that same thing applies to when you're presenting to a group, when you're standing up and doing that public speaking, or or you're having that dialogue. I love asking questions of the audience. Oh, and getting yes. people to tell me this is because then it's like, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I was thinking. Or, oh, that's a little different. I hadn't thought of it that way. And now I, I might have to pivot or I'm going to say my my prepared remarks and say, you know, I hadn't prepared for this. This is really interesting. Or there's just something to react to. Yeah. And and we just get so much by just being curious about our audience and about the other people that we're talking to in a way that's really about really invaluable. I love that. I love that idea of thinking about this, not just in one-on-one conversations, but one-to-many conversations, like you just said, asking those questions with a curiosity and a compassion to understand what the audience is thinking and feeling. As you said, 
it might reinforce what you're already thinking, but it can offer new insights that allow you to really connect and to really make that that component. I mean, and again, I mean, Todd talked about a lot of different things, toasts to, you know, a presentation to your boss, to others. And I don't see any of those situations where that can't have some actual component within it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Matt, by the way, just, just a track back to, <laughs> to, yeah. to Matt. I also wanted to bring up one of my favorite stories that we learned from our, our buddies at the Busara Center. Oh, yes. On the Trier stress test. So they, uh, first of all, uh, if you're a regular listener, you've probably heard this, but the Trier stress test was developed in 1933 at 1993. Oh, 1993, excuse me, um, uh, by the Trier University. And these these German researchers, they were trying to figure out, well, what actually happens when people, you know, get up and, and, and speak in front of small groups of people. And so they they had a subject present on a specific topic in front of three experts. And oftentimes those experts are in like white lab coats, you know, and they're seated at a table, the three, you know, these three experts at a table, you know, facing the uh, presenter. So there's this very formal aspect about it. And then right before the, the speaker, the subject goes on, they take a blood test and uh, put them on a heart rate monitor. And of course, they see all kinds of elevations in things like heart rate and cortisol. That, yeah, the stress that, hormone. Yeah, that stress hormone. It's high. And the cool thing about the Busara test is that when they, when Busara ran this in Nairobi, in Kenya, they found that none of the subjects had elevated heart rates and their cortisol levels weren't elevated either. And so they asked, well, why aren't you stressed? Why, why are you okay going out and talking to these subjects on or these these experts on this very specific subject. And apparently in Nairobi, two things happen. One is the whole culture is oriented around public speaking. Like they just love it. They they just well, they adore. do it. They do it more often than what we would. I think it's part of that that community, the village, and how they they kind of have evolved over the course of their their culture. And so that's a key aspect of yeah. what they do. Yes. And, and the second part. The only people that wear white lab coats in Nairobi are butchers. So, <laughs> so nobody was really scared about speaking in front of the butchers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of my favorite things. Again, context matters. And this is one of those amazing stories about how we assume things because we've done this research in the weird world and in other areas of the world, it doesn't matter. But I think going back to uh, Matt's kind of component here, it also lays out this really nice thing. It's like, hey, if people in Kenya aren't nervous about speaking, it's another way to reframe. It's another yeah, way to right. think about this. It's like, exactly. this does not have to be the default. The default can be that this is easy, that this is fun, that this is part of who and what I am. And that being in front of people in white lab coats or experts, whatever, maybe they're just butchers. Maybe, <laughs> and just, not saying that butch, just butchers is wrong, but they're butchers. And, and I don't have to worry about feeling like I, I don't know the exact words unless I'm talking butchering, which then I would be totally uh, uh, nervous about in front of butchers because I have no clue how to do that. So Hopefully that will never happen. <laughs> Hopefully you're right. <laughs> Hopefully you don't want Kurt butchering anything. So outside of this podcast that I do on a, on a weekly basis. <laughs> All right. So I think that should wrap up our grooving session and wrap up this conversation with Matt. It was... Uh, it was uh, really fun and, and great. Super fun. Yeah. M no. Matt's a generous guest and we're grateful to him. It was, it was really a, a lot of joy. And if you liked it, if you listeners had a good experience, first of all, check out Matt's podcast. Oh, it's you, fantastic. Because it's yeah. great. Uh, and uh, give us a like or a dice rating or a short review. We would really appreciate that because we don't do this for fortune. We do it for fame. And, <laughs> or 
actually, we don't even do it for fame. No, <laughs> we're not very famous. No. Uh, but it does go a long way in helping other people learn about behavioral grooves if you if you give us a good review. So we would really appreciate that. So go out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, follow us on Twitter or X or whatever it is, or threads. I'm on threads now. There you go. It's It's great. Or whatever the new social media platform is this week. Uh, and like us and, and give us a shout out. That would be fantastic. So this week, we hope that our conversation with Matt gets you better prepared as you go out and do your public speaking in such a way that will help you find your group. Mm-hmm.